Just wait a couple of minutes, yeah, don't worry. Sure. <clears throat> okay, maybe we can uh, start. So today uh, we have a special uh, family lunch, string family lunch. It's a uh, Pleasure to have Yao giving us a talk, despite the fact that it's uh, midnight almost for him over there in China, 11 p.m. He's going to talk about a very exciting topic and exciting for many reasons, but uh, not the least of which, which was the topic of this year's Nobel Prize, the black holes and the connection with relativity. He will tell us about why they should exist rigorously from the point of view of general relativity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Uh, so yeah, it's close to midnight, but it's okay, not bad. So I'm going to talk about some works that I did many years ago, about 40 years ago. Actually, I still remember Andy Strominger and Gary Horace was in the Institute for Advanced Study when I did this. I don't think they paid too much attention to this paper. Uh, although yes, Andy we did. <laughs> you did? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. So let me start out. The concept of black hole, uh, of course, was well known, proposed by Laplace way back in 18th century, where he said that there can be an object whose gravitational fields are so strong that even light cannot escape. But nothing was done on this proposal, except just talks. Until in 1916, right after Einstein wrote down the Einstein equation, uh, Schwarzschild wrote down his solution to the Einstein equation, which is well known, of course. 
M is a mass of the black hole, actually, uh, or the star. You really want to fill it in with some uh, material. It has a singular point when R equals zero, where the curvature goes to infinity. So therefore, physical law cannot be interpreted as such a point unless you try to bring in quantum mechanics. But classically, we have a problem there. But that problem is obvious. Curvature goes to singular, go to infinity. There's not much you can do with that. You cannot remove it. It was proved by Birkhoff, G.D. Birkhoff in Harvard in 1923, that is the only spherical symmetric solution of the vacuum Einstein equation. It represents the gravitational field outside any spherical symmetric body. That's really important, outside any spherical symmetric body evolving in any manner whatsoever. So this is an important contribution by G.D. Birkhoff. But there's a apparent uh, puzzle that there's a apparent singularity when R equals two M. Well, then people start to realize that there's a coordinate singularity. I guess it start probably you can go earlier. 1933, Lemaire uh, proved that it is actually a coordinate singularity, and it's be discovered by Finkelstein in 1958. When it was realized that. Uh, Hypersurface R equal to 2M is an event horizon. It's a boundary of the region of space time, which is causally connected to infinity. So there's R equal to 2M is only a coordinate singularity, but it's still played on the road as a result. Uh, well, the Schwarzschild solution has a huge group of symmetry, namely the sphere is spherical symmetric. So many people thought that such a singularity should not occur in a genetic situation. Well, this, this view was held by many people, uh, actually in Hawking and Ellis book, which I learned, uh, many Russians and other people uh, did not believe this is the case. And they fought and they even tried to do a perturbation around it to make the singularity go, uh, to, to make that go away. And this view was changed in 1965 by the famous work of Roger Penrose. It's one of the very original work that I know in mathematics, in mathematical physics. Uh, the proof is not hard actually, but he invented this concept of closed trap surface. It's a space-like two-dimensional surface sigma, such that the two family of now geodesic or orthogonal with sigma are convergent as sigma. So these are ongoing light rays that are drag back and converge. So one, one can interpret to say that light cannot uh, go away from this uh, surface. The important thing is that Roger Panels proved that existence of a closed trap surface implies that space time is incomplete as long as some energy condition holds for matters. And uh, what is a very beautiful work? Uh, up to now, I still were puzzled by this proof because it's proof by contradiction. Uh, you do not know where the um, singularity appears, which in general, in mathematics, we always know uh, how far the singularity may occur in hyperbolic equation. But in this proof by logic panels, we don't really know where it is. And of course, uh, this is general relativity. There's no global time or global distance. So it's a little bit difficult to say what that means. But nonetheless, he proved that space-time is incomplete. But the proof also is difficult to say what, what that means because incomplete just means geodesically incomplete. That may not be so bad after all the singularity theorem that all the panels prove. But it's still an important indication that something goes wrong. So this whole theory was developed uh, further by Hawking, uh, working with Roger panels also. So panels found closed trap surface exists in the above Schwarzschild solution. And the important thing is that closed trap surface exists whenever it is closed, the space time is closed to Schwarzschild. Therefore, the singularity will be there, it's stable. Whenever the space time is closed to Schwarzschild, it is uh, singularity will develop. So therefore, the singularity is stable in that sense and can up be put up away, which what uh, many other physicists thought it could be, because uh, they thought the singularity was created because of symmetry. But this seems to say that there's nothing to do with symmetry. It's always survived there. 
So panels and Hawking, on the other hand, did not explain how close trap surface arise in general space time and by what mechanism. They know that the singularity is stable, but not uh, in the case of Swarthew or KS Olsen, but we have to give the reason why a closed track surface should form for general space time. And this is what I'm going to explain now. So it was in this paper that Rick Stern and myself uh, in 1983, we proved the existence of black hole due to the title is called Existence of Black Hole Due to Condensation of Matter. That we gave the existence of closed trap surface from the first physical, physical principle. Uh, what we demonstrate is that uh, when matter density is large in a fixed region, closed trap surface will form. Uh, this argument is mathematically rigorous based on the general theory of general relativity. So this is really the first rigorous uh, demonstration of this statement, which you probably see a great deal in the popular magazine of how black hole form. Namely, when matter density is large, closed trap surface will form. Now, this is important to know that we actually do not use any special assumption on the matter. Uh, any state of matter would, would be fine for this purpose. Uh, so uh, it's a very general statement. We, the only uh, uh, assumption we make is the density of the matter. Well, as I said, uh, uh, so maybe li let's make it a little bit clear what Penrose did. He introduced the concept now infinity and define a future event horizon as a boundary of the causal class of future now infinity. And he proved this statement, which I mentioned earlier, uh, where he Prove that it cannot be future now to that they complete if it satisfy these three conditions. Uh, number one is uh, is the situation of a matter that is the matter density should be non-negative, and uh, there's non non-compact Cauchy hypersurface which we deal with when we are handling asymptotic thread or isolated physical system. The first statement is the cold trap surface. So. There's a well-defined concept of event horizon uh, by introducing the causal uh, path of future, now infinity and all that. But this is difficult to handle um, uh, mathematically, now infinity, because we really know very little about the future uh, um, of the whole hyperbolic equation. And so in general, nowadays, we, when we talk about black holes, we use the concept of closed trap surface. Um, when we say that we find closed trap surface, we declare a black hole is there. Uh, this, of course, is not, not really uh, completely accurate, but we, uh, that's a probably the best we can do uh, uh, because we don't know the future completely. And uh, well, until we know the general theory of hyperbolic equation, we cannot quite say more than that. Anyway, so now we use the initial data formulation of general relativity. Uh, you can do it for other characteristic formulation, but let's just do it for initial uh, data formulation. So we are given a slice of the space time, which is a three dimensional manifold space slice. So we have an induced metric, which I take it to be positive, positive definite metric Gij, and a symmetric tensor Hij, which is the second fundamental form of this three manifold sitting in space time. You may look at it as a kind of a linear momentum uh, because it's dGij over dt in that way. And we have a local density uh, and a local current density which account for the matter sitting in four space time. So this is a given data uh, for Einstein equations that evolve. Uh, once you have this data and you have the equation, you can evolve it. So mu actually is this statement. There's a constraint equation for general relativity. Mu, which is the matter uh, energy, local energy, is, is written to be half of scalar curvature. Scalar curvature out here is the scalar curvature of the metric Gij. And then you take norm of norm square of Hij, second fundamental form, or the linear momentum, and then plus the trace square. So this is the first constraint equation from the Gauss equation of the hypersurface sitting in space time. And then the Kodesi equation gives you another constraint, namely Ji, the local current, 
is equal to the covariant differentiation of the traces second fundamental form. So these are the constraint equation for a three dimensional manifold sitting in space time, which is a consequence of the Einstein equation. So um, this is a constraint equation and it has to be, to be true uh, on the hypersurface. And we always assume the local energy condition, namely mu is bigger than equal to norm squared, uh, norm squared and then take the square root. So this means the matter density is non negative. So this is an assumption that we will make uh, all the way. So mu minus the right hand side on the bottom will be considered as our matter density, basically. So we shall call a closed surface in the free space to be a pan horizon if the mean curvature satisfies the following statement. The mean curvature is equal to plus or minus trace of H. So H is a tensor, uh, second fundamental form, this check to sigma, I can take its trace. And we require the mean curvature of sigma to be equal plus or minus that. So this is basically the extremal part of the closed trap surface. And it's either plus or minus, depending whether it is a closed trap, it's future trap or past trap. The side corresponding to time, whether you're pointing to the future or pointing to the past. Well, of course, you can make a choice. Uh, Einstein equation is uh, in Rayner and the past and future. So uh, according to the theorem due to Penrose and, uh, and Hawking, we know that existence of such a, a plan horizon would imply the four dimensional space time is not geodesically complete. So from now on, we call such a survey the black hole because that's the only way that we can define it so that uh, we can understand it instead of knowing what, what happens at infinity. In a, we don't have the complete knowledge about infinity. Okay, now let's go to the film that I did with Rick Shirt, a uh, uh, long time collaborator. And um, so let us take a bound region in the slice N, where we are supposed to be a, a certain point of the a slice of the space time. And assume the mean curvature of the bounded omega one with respect to the inward normal at the x1 to that. I assume x1 to be bigger than trace of the second form fundamental form along the boundary. So this um, is a condition showing that the uh, omega one is reasonable uh, convex. And um, this holds whenever we have asymptotic flat space time as a slice which most people assume when we deal with the isolated physical system. So make it so that uh, the boundary condition holds in that way. Then we prove that if omega one, this region contains no apparent horizon, then there's a unit solution F in omega one to the following equation, star. So gij minus fi fj divided by one plus square f square multiply with this fij uh, square root of that minus xij. But this equation was used by uh, Zhang, a Korean physicist a long time ago. Uh, he wrote down the equation uh, to study um, uh, the, the conjecture of panels. But he thought that this useless uh, uh, by communicating with them because he thought the smooth solution does not exist. Therefore, it is uh, no use. So he gave up on working on this when we looked to him. And, but then we, with good luck or maybe with some insight, you can say, we found this equation does not exist is actually a blessing. Uh, so Richard and I go ahead, despite it may not exist, the global solution, uh, which is true, the smooth solution does not exist in general. We said, let's go ahead because we know this equation is very similar to minimal surface equation. Uh, if you don't take Hij uh, there, that means Hij equals zero. This is the equation for minimal surface graph. So Rick Shen and I have been working on minimal surface for a long time by that time. So we are happy with this, this thing. And we thought that it is uh, too bad to give them up completely, such a nice thing to do. So we look at this. We do a perturbation of this equation, putting epsilon f on the right hand side. Then we prove that such a guy always exists when epsilon is strictly positive. 
and it is a graph, uh, and we set f epsilon to be equal to zero on the boundary of omega one. So this is very nice. We know that uh, this actually always exists whenever epsilon is uh, uh, positive. So we then we prove that a sequence of epsilon converges smoothly in the neighborhood of the boundary when epsilon goes to zero. In other words, f epsilon is actually uniformly nice, independent of epsilon, in a fixed neighborhood of boundary omega one. So you see, you know, a solution exists f epsilon and you need, and then it's controlled in a uniform manner near the boundary. So it's good. We can push them to, to go. But then when we push them to go, it may blow up vertically along some surface sigma in omega one. So we prove that actually it blows up in a nice, beautiful, smooth way. Uh, so there's a cylinder on this surface with the base equal to sigma and F epsilon will be close to this cylinder in an exponential manner. And we demonstrate that this surface are a parent horizon. So what happens is that we create a parent horizon out of nowhere in a way by taking epsilon go to zero. So this gives you a way to produce a parent horizon uh, as a tool. You see, you look at this equation and you know it exists for epsilon strictly positive. And then I prove that uh, when epsilon goes to zero, either F exists everywhere uh, smoothly or it must blow up and the blowing up space must be a parent horizon. So how do we prove something uh, uh, you say uh, the apparent horizon exists. So let's just do a simple exercise here. I rewrite the equation in above to be this form. Divergence of grad f divided by square root one plus grad f square equal to the right hand side. So this is just rewriting the equation without epsilon. Now the left hand side actually is a uh, you integrate the left hand side is always less than equal to the Bounded omega for any region inside omega one. That's simple because grad f divided by square root one plus square f square is less than equal to one. So when you integrate it, it becomes a bounded term, and the bounded term, the integral is less than equal to one. So therefore, the left hand side when you integrate over omega is less than equal to the volume or the boundary. Uh, simple, just left hand side. So the left hand side is always less than equal to the volume or the boundary. And the right hand side, on the other hand, is not so trivial. Uh, that's uh, how we know that the, this, this equation does not, cannot be solved in general. So in fact, if I write Hij to a bigger than your lambda Gij, and if the trace of H, Hij is greater than capital H, then write capital lambda to the H minus lambda. Then I can look at the, in, the, the right hand side here. The right hand side can be write down to be bigger than equal to lambda times the volume of omega. So what does this capital lambda mean? This capital lambda basically means that two sub, the two free principal character of H, sum of these two is reasonable large. That's what lambda says. If the sum of these two principal character is large enough, then you must satisfy this inequality. Now notice that this, this inequality is supposed to hold for all omega inside. And what this means is actually it implies the first eigenvalue of omega is greater than lambda square over four. Now the first eigenvalue of uh, omega is some quantity you can calculate given a domain. So it says a simple statement here that which I just derived. If the first eigenvalue, you know, for 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 the trivial eigenvalue problem uh, with no potential. If it's less than lambda squared over four, where lambda equal to x minus lambda, then a parent horizon must fall. So this just follow from the, 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 the equation that I wrote down and I found out this statement. I think this statement is actually interesting. The first eigenvalue of omega one is a rather global statement. Uh, and, uh, actually, capital lambda need not be a constant in this case, and our conclusion is that for some omega, if the boundary omega is less than capital lambda integral over here, then a black hole must fall. So the lambda is actually some kind of momentum. 
the sum momentum density is large enough compared with boundary omega divided by volume omega, then a black hole must form. That's what number one said. So remember, lambda corresponding to the sum of two principal curvature, which come from HIJ. HIJ is, is kind of linear momentum. So when the linear momentum is large, then you can form a black hole. That's what this says. Well, this is interesting, I think, uh, because I, I think one should be able to derive from Einstein equation, uh, starting from some uh, small um, HIJ to arrive at number one. Uh, if you look at the dynamics of Einstein equation sufficiently carefully. Well, um, but this is not as interesting because I want to say something uh, more physical. So I, that's what, what Rick Strand and I come in uh, to understand this in a more, in a, in a more detailed manner. Um, okay. So in any case, the previous argument already shows that some focusing effect will form a black hole. If I know HIJ is large relative to volume of boundary omega divided by omega, just any omega would do. Uh, but the true physical meaning of one is not clear enough compared with what Rick Strand and I did in 1983. So what we prove is this following statement, which takes a serious effort to do. Namely, if mu minus j, which we call the matter density, is bigger than some lambda, lambda is large, in a domain omega whose radius is less than phi over two pi over square root lambda, then a black hole forms. So what this is that is statement it says that if I fix radio omega and lambda being large, which I can measure exactly how large it is, then a black hole will form. So this is a statement I said, if the matter density is large enough in a fixed omega, a black hole will form. Actually, not only a black hole will form, we actually know the size of a black hole form in this way. And uh, we can measure, uh, we, we have a statement about it, which let me not talk about it at this moment. Uh, now, this is a very general statement as we do not assume any symmetries of the space time. And we do not assume any special condition on the state of the matter. In many uh, papers that appear in uh, general relativity, they assume fluid dynamics or dust or whatever with some state of, uh, of the equation, but we make no assumption whatsoever here. So only matter density is used here. Okay. Now let us see um, how uh, we understand the, these things, um, uh, the, the argument. And this argument is actually interesting because we do a dimension reduction, uh, which is somewhat unusual in geometry that we can uh, argue by reducing dimension one by one. And this, I think, is probably should be interesting uh, for physical, um, uh, um, I mean, for GR by itself. So anyway, so let me explain the proof to you now, the proof that Rick Strand and I have. Now I take a product manifold. Omega one is the original three dimensional manifold we are interested in. I take its product with R. So I'm looking at the graph over here. The data that I have, gij, hij, is defined omega one. And I can extend these two data to, to omega one cos r trivially. Uh, gij on omega one, and I take dt square on r. So the Euclidean product metric, that's trivial to know. hij was defined in omega one. I just leave it up to the product space, uh, trivially extend to r. Then we are looking for hypersurface in omega one cos r. So the boundary of this new hypersurface is the same as the original boundary. But then we are looking at the mean curvature of omega one in the product space. Now omega one bar is actually just a general hypersurface now. I want it to be equal to trace of h bar ij on omega one bar. So h bar ij is the proof bed of the hij I just said. It's defined on omega one cos r. So it turns out the equation that we discussed before is this equation. The mean curvature omega one equal to trace of hij bar. And this equation on the left, if it is given by graph that I call it f before, this is exactly divergence of gradient f divided by square root one plus square f square. The right hand side is the trace that we used before. Now, once you write it down in this equation, you can see that the apparent horizon will come in. Because 
if the surface, if the if the graph turn vertical, uh, namely it becomes a cylinder of a surface in omega one cross R, the mean curvature turn into mean curvature of the two dimensional surface in the three dimensional manifold. So left hand side is a mean curvature, and the right hand side is a trace over that thing. This is the equation for the apparent horizon. So it's important we interpret that equation in a correct manner. And this comes in to show the apparent horizon comes up whenever it shows in. So um, now that we do a um, calculation, which is very important for all this as well. We look at a submanifold, as I said, it has a second fundamental form by itself. The hypersurface sitting omega one cross R has a second fundamental form. We denote it by Pij. So let us say the graph omega one bar can be written as graph x f x, uh, and we translate mu and j as before. So the normal vector field can be translated vertically because we are on a graph now. I just move it up and down, move the graph. And that's an important thing that we can move a graph up and down by, and that's a natural translation vertical one. And now the normal vector field for omega one bar is not the vertical vector field, but it's a normal to the hypersurface. I call it E4. And I can define Pij, uh, which is second fundamental form everywhere. Turns out Pij at the beginning is defined only on the hypersurface because I can, but because I can translate it up and down, Ij can go from one to four. In this way, I, it turns out I can calculate. This is a long calculation, but it turns out to be, to be good. Namely, the scalar curvature of omega one bar satisfies this equation. So half out bar minus summation xij minus pij squared, ij less than equal to three, less than equal to three, and then xi4 minus pi4 squared plus di xi4 minus pi4. If this turns out to be equal to mu minus j dot e4. Now mu minus j, j dot e4 is actually bigger than equal to mu minus absolute value j, which I call it to be the matter density. But this, this quantity mu minus j dot e4, I believe it has more meaning than, uh, than what it is. I just, we just throw it away. Uh, mu minus j dot e4, j dot e4 is an interesting quantity, but we, we just let it go by saying that it's bigger than equal to mu minus absolute value j. So R bar is a scalar curve in omega bar where the metric is dij plus fifj. So what do we get? Given the initial data, gij and, and also xij, I produce a pij and I produce a new metric. The new metric is gij plus fifj. This new metric satisfies a good equation for R bar. Uh, this turns out to be a equation, a inequality similar to matter density to be non-negative. So what we would did is that given the initial data set, GI, GIJ, XIJ, I produced a new initial data set, GIJ plus FIFJ. And here I set the second fundamental we could seal. So what is good thing about this uh, inequality? The good thing about this inequality is that if I take any function vanishing on the boundary of omega one, I multiply it, I get this simple inequality. And this inequality comes out from integration by part. You see, I multiply this equation by phi square, I can integrate by part on di. And I use the middle term to cancel the inequality, apply Schwartz inequality. So a simple manipulation, uh, uh, manipulation shows this inequality. So integral half r bar phi square plus d phi square is bigger than equal to lambda integral phi square. So this comes out from the equation we just mentioned. And this statement shows that the first Dirichlet eigenvalue of the operator minus the project bar plus r bar over two is at least lambda. Lambda is the, the lower bound that I mentioned before uh, is the method density j mu minus j. So now I know by the manipulation, I start out, namely from gij and xij, I produce a new data. Uh, the new data has a property that we get a gij plus fifj, the new metric. It makes this equation holds, namely 
the operator, the eigenvalue of the Laplacian minus Laplacian plus alpha over two is at least lambda. Well, what about the radius that we defined before? Because the metric that we construct is greater than Gij, the radius is getting bigger. So therefore, if I can prove this bottom inequality, if we assume that, then we're getting into the similar inequality. So this bottom inequality did not lose out uh, in, by passing to a new metric, Gij plus Fifj. When we go to a new metric, it still holds, and that's good. So this is, this is a dimensional reduction procedure that we start now. So what, what we do is the following thing. We prove that if omega is a three-dimensional manifold, such as the first eigenvalue of the operator minus the positive plus r over two, if it's at least lambda, then the radius of omega one is less than this constant. Well, so this is the statement that we can prove in general, which I'm going to prove you. But this proves the state that the, the black hole exists in theorem. Why? Because if I assume the radius here, I assume a unicord on the bottom to be going in the wrong side, strictly bigger than that. That's what I can assume. Then this theorem said that this is wrong. What goes wrong is because our first eigenvalue of that is bigger than lambda. But how do we get this inequality? We get it because we can solve the equation up there. Uh, well, we can solve it globally, so therefore we imply that. But what it means is that something goes wrong means that I cannot solve this equation globally. So f does not exist globally. If f does not exist globally, that means it must blow up somewhere. It blows up some. If it blows up somewhere. We prove with big, with great effort actually that it must define a apparent horizon for you. So this is the the the, 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 the way of thinking. Assuming there's no apparent horizon, we prove that omega one bar exists globally, and I derive this inequality. And then from this inequality, I de derive this first division eigenvalue of this operator is at least lambda. And then I prove this following freedom, which I need to prove. I have not proved it yet. This holds. This, on the other hand, violates the assumption I make at the very beginning that the density must be uh, large in a ball radius omega one. So now the proof of that uh, uh, important uh, uh, existence freedom for black hole is reduced to prove this statement. Why this is true? This is actually a rather beautiful film after 40 years, I look at it still. The reason is that it's difficult to estimate first eigenvalue on Laplacian minus Laplacian plus R over two. And it, uh, well, of course, you can always estimate it if you put in a lot of data. Here, we only put in one data, namely the radius of omega one. And this is very difficult to do in general, but we managed to do it, so it's very nice. So let's, let, let me tell you how we do this one. This depends on dimensional reduction. So the basic principle for the induction is the following way. Given a manifold n, which sets you a certain positivity on your scalar character, we form a stable minimal hypersurface in N. This stable minimal hypersurface is a minimal hypersurface, which is stable when we do the area. We do the volume over it. We move the hypersurface slightly, uh, perturb it, and look at the volume you know, for the near perturbation. And we see, we assume that the volume does not, is still a uh, uh, local minimum. That's what stable means. We prove that this stable hypersurface, uh, this stable minimum hypersurface can be conformally deformed to a manifold, which also satisfies similar positivity on this scalar curvature. So this is the principle that we use. So positivity on scalar curvature can go down in dimension if we know that the hypersurface is stable minimal surface. This is a very important observation that Rick and I made uh, long ago. Uh, actually, we know this one in 1970 seven uh, already. Now this conformal factor will be the first eigenfunction of the second order differential operator associated to the step, stability of hypersurface. So when we say it is stable with respect to minimality of the, the area, then they associate to you a second order elliptic operator. And we take that to be, uh, we take the first eigenfunction of that 
to be our conformal filter. So I conformally change the, the minimal hypersurface by this conformal filter. This eigenfunction does not vanish in the interior of M. It has a general very little principle. First eigenfunction does not change size. So we can do it. So let's see how it works in the, the field that I'm proving. So let, let F be the first eigenfunction of this operator that I just looked at, minus a function plus R over two. And this is the function that we, this operator we want to deal with. Uh, this is what I said positivity in some sense. Uh, this is a first eigenfunction uh, is good, uh, bigger than capital lambda. This assumption. The assumption is this operator minus a function plus R over two has eigenvalue bigger than equal to lambda, lambda is strictly positive. So I write down this solution for this equation, F. F is now positive by assumption because the first eigenfunction. Then I multiply and then I'm looking, then I shall look for a stable submanifold, minimum submanifold to the, to the three dimensional manifold. Omega one is three dimension. Now I look for a minimal disk. So I take a curve in, this, in the three manifold, I bound, I solve a minimal disk inside it. So gamma will bounding a sigma surface sigma. And I define the area to be integral sigma times f, integral of f over sigma. So basically I multiply uh, the conformal factor, I'm, I'm minimizing the conformal area. Then I prove that AF has a minimum, is minimizing uh, this functional, I found a sigma, which make it to the minimum. And the second variation uh, principle associated to this functional AF is still not negative. Then we can define a linear operator associated to it by calculation, we found it to be L5, where phi corresponds to deformation field. It becomes this uh, gadget, minus R plus M phi plus F inverse square phi dot square F and, and the last, last term. Of course, I manipulate a little bit here. I get the scalar curve. I get the, the, the scalar curve or the Gauss curve out uh, by some simple manipulation of the Gauss formula, Gauss curve formula. So L is this operator. And now L should have a positive eigenfunction uh, as a minimum. So I, so, but on that hand, I do have to use the first equation for F. F satisfies this equation. I plug this one into here into this, this inequality here. And then I found out the, the, the L, the operator L is simpler. It looks like this form, where K is the Gauss curvature. And the whole thing is much simpler now. Uh, but then I'm going to look at this uh, eigenfunction for phi. Again, the first eigenfunction of phi and call it G. G is the first eigenfunction of L. So I'm doing induction. So I, in, I, in, I do an induction from three manifold to the two dimension surface to the two dimension disk. And then from two dimension disk, I do the same thing again. I get this operator L, I get a function G, which is five, first eigenfunction of L. I do an induction again. So what do I do induction? Now it's two dimension. I do from two dimension to one dimension. Then in that case, I find pawn X in sigma, which has distance radius omega away from gamma. That's part of the definition of radius omega. And then I look at the integral of f, uh, of, uh, of f times g, f is the original f that we use. I conform to deform the metric already, so f is still there. And then multiple of g, which comes from this first eigenfunction. So integral fg, minimize along the curve. And then I do the same thing again. Uh, we can do the second variation of this functional i along the geodesic. And it must be non-negative. And I calculate the, the operator again, get L naught. <coughs> and I move around. And of course, I simplify the argument here. And finally, I prove that uh, that d square over d square minus two over three lambda has non-negative eigenvalue where lambda is should be capital lambda here on the on the on the interval C O to L. But I get, I mean, an equation of this type on the interval, we can solve explicitly. And so we know that small l cannot be too big if uh, yeah, this small lambda is actually capital lambda. So that's the way we know the radius cannot be too big because l is the length of the, you know, the curve that we have. So as a result, I proved the radius of, of uh, the, the 
omega cannot be bigger than equal to root three over two pi over lambda, square root lambda. So this is a rather explicit bound. We prove therefore that, prove this statement now, uh, that this statement uh, holds and that means there's a black hole inside such a thing. Now, the scale of the whole uh, constant comes out to be pretty good. Basically, uh, it's slightly bigger than neutron star. And more or less, it says that if you take a, a matter density uh, bigger than a neutron star, not much bigger, then you must collapse to a black hole. So in a way, it says that after neutron star, there's not much more you can hope except for black hole. Um, we can prove the apparent horizon in here uh, can be proved to be live entirely within omega and have diameter at most two pi over root three lambda. So, uh, so this is uh, rather precise. We know exactly how big it is, the density, and also how big the diameter is here. Well, later on, uh, this was done very early, and later on, uh, we observe, I observe in a simple thing that if I allow the boundary to have some uh, some mean curvature, so you are defined C to be this minimum, then a pair horizon forms whenever radius of omega is bigger than three over two pi over C. So here you do not need to use matter, uh, just the boundary uh, is uh, mean curvature is good enough to form a black hole. So. Uh, well, if we start with smooth initial data with no apparent horizon, we can find non-singular source and U of star. But this function is determined uniquely by the data, as I said. If we assume the initial data is asymptotic flat. Now, if we consider asymptot the perturbed equation star with the right-hand side being epsilon U, or well, epsilon F, actually, in my previous notation, somehow I, I forgot it, I used U here. That means we know this equation has a unit non singular solution, uh, whether the apparent horizon exists or not, as we know is always true. And we know u epsilon will blow up along apparent horizon when epsilon goes to zero. And therefore, we can understand the interior of the apparent horizon by looking into this function, v epsilon equal to epsilon u epsilon. So I take this function, uh, which always exists. Uh, it depends on epsilon. And I plug in the original equation, it becomes this equation I look down here. The right hand side is V epsilon. And I, if I take V epsilon, uh, go epsilon, go to zero. In fact, we can prove that in my table of ratio that V epsilon and grab V epsilon are found independent of epsilon. So this is allowed because I multiplied uh, the solution by epsilon. And I take V equal to the limit of V epsilon because uh, is bound, you can always take a subsequence to make it true. Then you set about this equation double star. Uh, this is an interesting equation. Uh, this equation appear because I take epsilon goes zero in this year. And this uh, is a uh, equation which says the mean curvature of V, of the, of the level set of V equal to the, uh, the trace of second power form along the, along the, the level set. So, this function exists inside the apparent horizon, um, and it gives you a way to understand the apparent horizon in the interior. Uh, how it actually tells you in detail, I do, do not really know yet, but we know that it has a full relation by level set of V, which satisfies some interesting uh, uh, condition on the curvature, mean curvature. And uh, so my Student Chen did some numerical calculation and also do some uh, uh, theoretical calculation. In the case of Einstein Kai-Gordon equation, one can have initial data which has no apparent horizon at the beginning, and the dynamics of the Einstein equation can drive the apparent horizon form due to the blowing up of this limit. So you can prove that some of dynamical solution exists. Now it's interesting on other hand, double star. It says it, uh, it tells you something about the equation uh, in the interior, in the apparent, or, uh, in, within the apparent horizon. Uh, so this double star gives some description of space within the apparent horizon. Since V is constructed by U epsilon, the interior of the apparent horizon remembers some geometric information outside the apparent horizon. Uh, 
But you should remember when you have, we can prove you epsilon is unique and it can, but there could be different V by potentially choosing different epsilon i go to zero. Epsilon i go to zero, u epsilon i may go to V and u epsilon i pi may go to V pi, different V and different V pi. So, but they blew up along the, uh, the apparent horizon, but we could have different apparent horizon. So both V and V pi satisfy this equation, double star. They are bound with solution of double star and vanishing outside the apparent horizon. The level set of V has mean curvature equal to trace of xij plus the value of V. So they carry information of geometry in the interior of the black hole. So in some way, the information inside the black hole actually has entanglement with the information outside the black hole because of this, uh, the, the V is reaching outside. So this uh, was uh, the thing that relate to what I did with rate. And this was generalized somewhat by several people and even recently by uh, 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 Martin and uh, Gil and myself. Uh, and uh, she and Tam, my friends in Hong Kong, carry out some argument to prove existence of minimum surface based on the assumption on quasi-local mass. In this argument, I use density of matter and uh, also or the boundary effect, uh, but uh, the more ideal situation, you use quasi-local mass so that we don't need to know matter density. So this was uh, carried out uh, in this recent paper where you use a concept of quasi-local mass. So at this juncture, I think quasi-local mass is important for understanding of black hole also. So let me just roughly say what, uh, what the many people who does uh, work on quasi-local mass, but I will talk about the work that I did with, with uh, Muta Wang in Colombia. So how do we define quasi-local mass? We take a two-dimensional space-like surface with a physical data, namely the metric itself plus the mean curvature vector in the space time. And given these two data, well, H is in the normal bundle of the Riemann surface sigma, we can solve an optimal isometric embedding equation, which give an embedding of sigma into Minkowski space time, where the image surface sigma naught has the same induced matrix as sigma. When then, one then compare the extrinsic geometries of sigma and sigma naught, and evaluate something local, uh, quasi local mass from the metric H and H naught. So let's show it to you. Um, so, what happens is this sigma, the two dimensional surface where we want to measure is quasi local mass, has two physical data one, the metric, and the mean curvature vector. It gives rise to the norm of H and also some connection form on a normal bundle. You map it into R3, comma one, the Minkowski space time, and, and we have the data uh, H naught corresponding to being a surface into Minkowski space time, and we take a time like unit Turing field in R3, comma one. It's just take any any uh, 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 constant vector basically, and I define the function called the time function minus X dot t. This is just the slice by time function. And we define a function low and the one form in this way is defined here. Well, these two concepts looks uh, complicated, but it's actually not that complicated uh, because it satisfies the following uh, equal, uh, uh, optimal isometric embedding equation. First of all, the embedding is isometric, namely the induced metric from Minkowski space time equal to sigma. And then it should be a divergence free for this J vector. And the quasi local mass uh, is actually just integral low. So this load is compare the some quantity involving tau and also the mean curvature and take its difference and divide normalize it in a suitable form. And then we define the current in this way. And then it turns out everything is very simple. The total case our local mass is simply integral low. This is a, a good way to match uh, some surface uh, in Minkowski's space time with the physical space time uh, geometry. And we proved that this guy is positive in general and seal for surface in the Minkowski space time. We call this one to be quasi local mass. So this can be calculated explicitly. And in a genre with Punan Chen, we also define quasi local conserved quantities, 
which means that if you take any rotation curing field or any other field, uh, curing field in R3 common one, you can define the quasar local conserved quantity by this integral, both rho and also j. So if k is a rotational vector field, this gives rise to the rotation, the angular momentum part. So this is the way that uh, uh, quasar local uh, mass is used. And this can be used, as I said, to talk about the existing black hole by replacing uh, the density by quasar local mass to make it more global. Now, in the other direction, we should mention that actually I have extensive uh, uh, exchange with Chris Dodo in 1983 when I gave a talk on, on this paper of lecture. He is always interested to see how to make this one work for, for dynamic uh, situation to form a trap surface. So, first thing he did in 1991, he proved a for spherical symmetric scalar field, he found a sufficient condition for the formulation, formation of trap surface, and he expressed it in terms of the Hawking mass and also in terms of radius uh, of two spheres which lie on the future outgoing now cone and which defines a now angular region. And then he later extended analysis to the cause of solution of bound variation. And then he construct next singularity in this system and show the next singularity are unstable and does not generic and therefore prove in this special case weak uh, cosmic sensitive. And then in just a about 12 years ago, he finally moved the condition of spherical symmetry and found a way to form trap surface dynamically by radiation. But this is not a general uh, statement uh, like what we did before. He construct some the, the initial data or the data uh, in a catalytic uh, uh, situation, uh, proving that you can manage it to form a black hole initially when there's no singularity and become as a, and the singularity produced later. These were generalized by many people. Many people are better experts than me, which I leave down here. Now, finally, I want to show you some work that is being done here in China. And uh, um, so maybe, maybe uh, uh, so we know uh, there are static black holes, small shield and care, which are the major things. And they are only static solution. Uh, but when there's matter, there are other solutions such as a uh, barnick McKinnon solution for the einstein young wheel. This also found to be dynamically unstable, unfortunately, but it remains a chance that other black hole may form. So we, if the regularity event horizon is not assumed. Uh, this is called no hair film, but I, I personally do not quite believe that black, no hair film is true in general. Uh, well, anyway, if a, if, if a black hole forms, uh, one likes to find it. And of course, this is uh, one of the great achievements in the black hole initiative uh, uh, project with all over the world. Uh, they have found the third of black hole, and it's presumably a clear black hole. And in the last few years, Andy Schrominger and his whole group of uh, researchers around him has found interesting structure outside the proton cell. Um, so, uh, we, so I suggest uh, uh, one of our faculty here in Tsinghua, uh, Mr. Xu, uh, to look into uh, this problem uh, because I found that uh, rather uh, exciting to look at what Andy and his group do. They were doing something on the photon cell, and we are, I suggest to use KM theory, uh, which is a famous dynamical theory, uh, extensively applied to astronomy. And uh, so there's some structure, turns out, on the cell itself. So uh, Andy and his group are looking on the exterior of the photon cell. So let's look at the care source, and this is famous care source. And we have four conserved quantities for a particle moving around. And this uh, particle's energy, E, and then the D component of the particle's angular momentum, LD. And then there's something called uh, Carter constant, which relates to theta. Uh, the theta is the angular moment, uh, angle here. And the total Hamiltonian, which is equal to minus half for the time like geodesic. So there are four conserved quantities for a, for a geodesic that we want to deal with. And these are massive. Uh, so we look at, uh, uh, so Mr. Su looked at massive particles, uh, while Andy and his group looked at uh, 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 particles with no mass. 
And we take a stationary perturbation, which means it's tau independent here. And, the part, and also the particle jet energy is constant. And we ignore radiation. It is a good approximation for short term. So this system is a Hamiltonian system. So we are basically trying to apply a point uh, theory on homoclinic tangles. So the left-hand side is the integrable system where you have a homoclinic orbit to the hyperbolic fixed point. After perturb, you get some chaotic phenomena. This is uh, applied to a rather general uh, dynamical system theory, so which we want to apply to this uh, 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 phonon cell corresponding to um, a black hole physics. So the phonon cells union are bound unstable orbits. This is a special thing for K. Olsen. You have bound unstable cell orbits. The cell consists of size of spherical orbits with constant radial component. And each spherical orbit is unstable under radial perturbation. So you, you get expansion, and expansion is measured by log del Rn over del R0, uh, 1 over gamma. So it's uh, unstable. And this, this is an example of such an unstable orbit uh, uh, on the photon cell, on the photon cell. So the radial equation can be written down in the following way, dr over d lambda square minus r, function of small r. And there are four parameters we found, uh, as we said, the geodesic is defined by these four parameters. By adjusting the four parameters, we can find this rc. Uh, in, in here, the graph of minus r, uh, it is, uh, at that point, the critical point, and it is uh, con uh, convex for r, but concave for minus r. So, so we are interested in this point, rc, which is unstable critical point, and you move to the right and come back and forth. This gives you homoclinic orbits, and these are interesting uh, situation. So there's something, some concept called Arnold diffusion. A generic perturbation of integral system can create orbit along which some action variables undergo a big oscillation. So the Arnold diffusion for the perturbed case also will give this zoom well orbit around the photon cell. It could have big oscillation in the angular momentum in the speed dilation. And you visit different spherical sizes and the angle can change significantly the, the range of it. So you can see the picture like this. So basically what you said is that you could have orbits of some, I guess some, some star which move around the, 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 the black hole and move out back in this orbit. So we occasional excursion along the homoclinic orbit. And far from the black hole, there should be uh, post-Newtonian approximation to work, but not quite near the black hole. And uh, particle energy equal one could have parabolic orbit is an analog of Newtonian free bodies uh, problem. And interesting enough is that a perturbed case also may have orbits of oscillatory type, which means a particle or a, a star could move all the way to infinity at the same time Keep, uh, keep it back and forth. So, so supremum go to infinity and the infimum is finite. So that means it oscillates back and forth. And this, uh, so the event horizon is defined by this, by this uh, equation, as we know, and it approaches the event horizon, the phi looks like one over uh, delta, and then it satisfies this, uh, uh, the infinite many oscillation, uh, rotations for the geodesic. And this will give rise to a hyperbolic fixed point with homoclinic orbit. So as a result, the chaotic orbit in outside the horizon should be able to be seen and it satisfies this interesting phenomena. So uh, it's not clear whether one can see this kind of picture in reality or not, but it's tempting to hope to look for it. And the phonon cell in the phase space forms a 40 sub manifold called a normally hyperbolic invariant manifold. Is robust under uh, robust under perturbation, and it has a uh, interesting uh, phenomena. That means each spherical orbit has a uh, uh, two frequency: one dependent on theta, one dependent on phi. And it's interesting to know the ratio omega theta divided by omega phi exhibit interesting uh, Biofontaine equation similar to what KAM did. So it's a function of r, the radius of spherical size. The spherical size is robust and the orbit is still uh, quasi-periodic and, uh, and chaos could appear. 
This gives a gap structure on the photon cell, photon cell. Each gap corresponds to a rational ratio nil. The larger the gap, the smaller the denominator. So the gap structure appears re related to this function omega theta divided by omega uh, phi, uh, related to the uh, diophonic uh, uh, inequality. So this is somewhat different from uh, what Andy and his whole group uh, works out. Uh, they are looking at now geodesic when there's no mass on the on the geodesic, and they they found interesting uh, uh, also subring structure outside the photon cell. So um, so a light ray can complete n half orbits, collecting n times more photons along its path. They give a, a ring on the screen subdivided into subring labeled by the number of circulation. So these are exponential narrower when approaching a photon cell. But the previous uh, uh, statement says that it's not exponentially small. So these are rather interesting uh, phenomena. Yeah. And I think uh, these are interesting uh, work uh, using uh, dynamical system theory to study black hole. And this, of course, somewhat different from the partial differential equation argument that we use. But in any case, I think one should mix up both and to try to understand black hole in more detail. Um, uh, but I, I hope this uh, will interest physicists more uh, when they, they, when you see that there are actually more structure we can bring into black hole. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and maybe everybody can unmute if, if you wish and thank uh, Ya for a wonderful talk. Uh, and uh, if uh, anybody has questions, can I unmute and ask your questions, anybody? <clears throat> uh, I wanted to ask a question about, uh, so you were considering the photon shell orbits, but uh, once that the angular momentum LZ changes along the orbit, is that due to emission of gravitational waves? No, there's nothing to do about this wave. As we said, we are we are ignoring the, the radiation. We are ignoring okay. the effect so, of radiation. It's the KAM theory, largely. So how does the uh, does the azimuthal angular momentum change along the orbit? Well, it's starting uh, exhibit chaotic phenomena, as I said. I mean, so you have to work. <laughs> Uh, pretty extensively to find that applying KEM theory. It's not, we write here only a few slides, but the, the, the calculation is more extensive than what you said. It's basically chaotic phenomena applying KEM. Okay. One, one question I have, yeah, in your, in your yeah. arguments for the black hole formation, you assume the positivity of energy momentum tensor. I think right. what we call the null energy condition, correct? Yeah, yeah, null so, energy. So there are examples in physics where null energy condition is violated, but the average null energy condition seems to be correct. So have you been able to, or have you thought about trying to generalize those theorems that we have to the average null energy condition positivity only? Well, I was asked this question for many, many years before already. And uh, I, I need to know what precise it is. I mean, if you, Make a small change of that now energy condition is certainly true. It can work out, but I do not know what's the best uh, best uh, assumption. When you say average, average in what way? Average along a no complete null line, or around no. complete null line. But we are proving existence in a in a in a PDE in a growth in a in a region, not just a line. Yeah, so I'm just saying the average null energy condition means that it's not locally positive point by point, but along the null, the average is positive. Okay, so maybe we should formulate in the following way. We take a, uh, a the tangent bundle along all the null cone. We average the null cone in a suitable way. We can, I can think about it in that way. But, uh, but previously, I, I didn't think in that way. I thought averaging in some spatial direction. Right, I see. Oh, no, it's still around the normal. Yeah, okay, so maybe I can think about it. I see. I'm the, not other sure. question, the other question I'll... I have is that what you said about the, you, saw, you, you talked about the Klein Gordon equation without matter. You said mm -hmm. and you talked about the formation of the horizon. This seems, yeah. this may be related to actually uh, one of the uh, motivation of what is called the distance conjecture for the swampland. That is, if you have a scalar field uh, which traverses more than a 
certain distance and field space, that, that will be behind the horizon of a black hole. And that's one of the motivations that the traversing of a scalar field for a long distance has to have a cost. In some sense, it's invisible. It should be inside the black hole. But I assume that that's what the condition that you're talking about, right? When you say that you find a black hole. Yeah, 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 similar to that, yeah. So okay, let, let's share it to me about what you said. Let me take a look. Okay, it would be interesting also to extend that to the cases where you have a, a potential in addition to that, to see what you can say. Scalar okay. field, uh, not just a massive scalar field, but also coupled to a potential. I don't I know if you have had similar thoughts about that. No, we have not seen it doing it yet. But let, let me think about it. Share me what you said about this. Okay, topic. I will. Yeah. Are there any other questions for you? If not, let's thank uh, Yao for this wonderful talk and uh, telling us about the history of the subject. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Midnight here. Okay, good night. <laughs> okay, bye.